Good morning and welcome. It's good to see you all today. Um, before we get started with our worship service, I have a couple of announcements to make. So if you have your bulletin with you, uh, I invite you to turn to it. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that are imminent. Uh, first, congratulations to um, Jordan and Nikki Nell. I got a chance to hold young Carter the other day, and he's a sweet kid. Um, ways to bless the family. There's a, a table set up, and so you, we can help provide some pampers and, or diapers and wipes and whatever else you want to, uh, just to help kind of celebrate the gift that they've been given in young Carter Daniel. Also, if you did not pick up a new uh, prayer guide and Bible reading sheet for April, they are still out in the literature rack just across from the bathroom. So if you see the green sheet, you know you've got the right one. Also out on the foyer's circular table, we've got Rediscover the Church or Rediscover Church. This was a book that the elders had read as a part of our retreat this year and kind of birthed the theme that we have for the year. So check it out, read it. Um, you'll be hearing some of the information either from Michael or myself throughout this month. Today, if you don't have plans for lunch, the Hydro Masonic Lodge is inviting you to come and be a part there. Um, this will be at uh, the cafeteria for the Hydro Eakley Schools. The meal benefits Special Olympics. And so go and enjoy a good meal and uh, uh, help uh, donate to a, a, a good cause. I've got a couple of people who would like to make announcements, so I will invite Krisha and then Blair to come forward. Good morning. Um, I have a few things this morning. So I was just asked to update everybody. Um, Connections Food and Resource Center had their annual Grand Can Sculpture Competition this past week. Um, I believe there were 14 teams and 14 sculptures. Um, some of them were just an attempt. Um, but the, um, <laughs> if you saw it on Facebook, um, the event raised $7,000 as well as 14,445 pounds of food, which equals 45,731 meals for hungry families in this area. So thank you to everybody who supports them. If you went and voted, I know some of you guys made snacks for the hospitality room, so thank you guys very much. And on that note, um, a few weeks ago, we mentioned that we will be doing a food drive at our potlucks. So we have potluck in two weeks, April 21st, and on the bulletin board out there in the foyer is a list that looks like this of some of their specific needs. Um, cereal is always a need, crackers, pasta, peanut butter, um, but please don't let that make you feel like you can't bring something. If you have something other than that that you would like to give, you are more than welcome to do that. Bring that to the potluck when you drop your dishes off. Also, at that potluck, there's an announcement in your bulletin. The kitchen committee will be presenting um, our budget, our proposed plan, and have a time for discussion on the proposed kitchen remodel. So please um, prepare for a little bit of a meeting afterwards. I think there's something else that the elders have, too. Um, so please come. There are pictures up in the fellowship hall on the doors leading up to the stage if you guys want to look and you can grab, um, grab us for questions if you have that. Um, and that committee is Dory, Ellen, Kathy Thomas, Kathy Schweitzer, Julie, and myself. So grab one of us if you have questions. And my last announcement is we have our first official fundraiser. <laughs> Woohoo! These little things, if you were at the Comforter Blitz, um, there was this mysterious bowl of crackers that we all just couldn't stop eating. We found out that Miss Caroline brought those and that it's this little packet that comes from Kansas. So she went and bought a bunch of these and brought them back for us. And um, for a minimum donation of $10, you can have one of these. It even has the bag in here that you mix it up in so you don't have to get your bowl all gross. So. If, and I have samples. If you want to try some of these crackers, come find me, and we have some of these little packets. So if you have questions on any of that, please come find me. Thank you. 
As Blair is coming forward, uh, Christian mentioned it, there will be a special members meeting on the 21st, and it is primarily to hear about the kitchen remodel. We will also be approving the annual, minute, annual business meeting minutes at that time. Blair. This is for the ladies of the church. Um, if you've noticed in your bulletin or up on the screen, um, there's an antique shopping trip planned for April 26th through 27th. So we're trying to get a feel if um, some ladies want to go up Friday evening and stay the night. And then um, the antique um, outdoor sale is in Jones, Oklahoma. So if you have any interest in that, um, there's a sign-up sheet out in the back on the table. And so even if you're not interested in going Friday and staying for Saturday. If you have an interest in just Saturday only, there's that option too that some can just drive up and meet. Okay, are there any other announcements that I'm not aware of? All right, just a couple last things. Um, just invite you to remember Kevin and Lakia Kane uh, in prayer, especially this coming Saturday. Lakia's mom's funeral will be Saturday at 2 p.m in Woodward, so keep them in mind. Uh, my last task today is to hand out uh, some of our clipboard prizes. So would Axel, Wesley, Whitney, and Lakin come on up? Congratulations, Lakin, Axel. Parents, thank you for your continued support of getting your children to be involved during our worship time. I noticed there was two of those kids that walked away with Brahms gift certificates. So continue to do those things. We want to reward it and hopefully it becomes a part of them becoming lifelong learners. Michael, will you call us to worship? Good morning, church. Church being those of us who have committed our lives to Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we're here this morning in this uh, building of just brick and mortar and steel, but we're here to worship Christ today. And if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ and become part of the church, to, what a beautiful day to do so. And I would encourage you to think about that. I wanted to thank uh, those of you who came to the Mennonite Disaster Service meeting yesterday um, to learn more about what uh, Oklahoma MDS is doing and, and what we would, how you could be put to use in service for our Lord, and service being a main product of being having a relationship with Jesus Christ and being part of our church. I see what you mean, Chris. Your standing here is a little difficult because I went down on the sand rock and, and found this. Let's just talk about the wheel a little bit and we'll see if we can tie it to the church. So what do we have going here? We have a hub. The hub is in the center. And the hub plays an important role because number one, it supports the rest of the wheel, right, through the spokes. And then the power is transmitted, if it's a drive wheel, from the hub out to the rim. And it is at the bottom of the rim where not the rubber meets the road, but it, where the rim meets the road and the work is done. So why am, I, um, why am I holding this up here and what does it have to do with the church? Well, let's just talk about it. I, I'm a visual learner, so, uh, so us individuals are out here. There could be Trevin out here. And, oh, I don't know, Erica out here on the rim, right? And all the rest of us are representative of the rest of us. And this the make up the church, right? Hmm, what would be, what's the purpose as a model of the church what would be in the center? What's the part, who or what it would make up the center of the church that supports the church, provides power to the rest of the church? 
Thank you. Thank you, of course. So, Jesus Christ is the center of our church. It is his church. He is the power. He supports the church. And he provides, he transfers power out to the individuals through the spokes. Now, what would the spokes represent? It could be worship. We actually listed these in Sunday school class, didn't we, Wes? Where are you? What were they? Worship, service, praise, prayer, right? All that makes up the church. So, got a question. It's everybody's, well, I hope it is, our desire that if we're part of the church that we want to draw closer to Christ, right? So what happens as we draw, and I'm sorry, they lay down on the job. What happens as we draw closer, we turn our eyes upon Christ, we focus upon him, and we draw closer to him? What happens to our um, position to each other? We get closer to each other, don't we? And hopefully we develop relationships, we grow closer in those relationships, and what's the purpose of those relationships but to do the purpose of God's church, right? I would ask you to, and I know many of us have these. Let's pull this book out for just a minute. And I'd like to refer to pages it's page 23 to just a couple little snippets. Starting out, Jonathan Lehman, it was one of the co-authors, Jonathan Lehman was uh, writing this, and he says, a church is a group of people gathering to be shaped by God's word, to live together as a different kind of people, one that's both in and not of the world. At the bottom of the page he says, a church is actually a gathering and a fellowship of the family of God, the body of Christ, the temple of the Spirit. Page 24 at the bottom he says, your church, our church, the one we want you to rediscover is the place where the Bible, and catch this, where the Bible says heaven has begun to descend to earth. And on top page 25, he has bullets. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at, a, is at hand where? Here, this morning, here. God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven where? Here, this morning. We store up treasures of heaven here. We bind and loose on earth what's bound and loosed in heaven here. And we are the heavenly temple. Heaven touches down on planet earth through our gathered churches. In conclusion, we, you, are the church. And I hope we have our eyes upon Jesus this morning. And as we worship together this morning, then we will draw closer together and seek his purpose for his church. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, we're gathered here in this building as your church, your church where you come to earth and dwell in and among us. We praise you, God, for your incredible love for us, through the giving of your son Jesus who died and is raised from the dead and now lives in each of us, your temples here on earth. We pray that as we worship together this morning that we will be drawn closer to you and to each other in that doing so we might serve out your purpose for us here on this earth. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to worship this morning, I invite you to stand as we sing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Guide
Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, you created us for your glory and created us to serve you. We come to you with grateful hearts for all the good things that you provide for us. We're grateful also that we live in a country where we can come together to worship you without fear. We also want to thank you for sending us your only son to deliver us from sins by dying on the cross, giving us the opportunity to receive your indescribable gift of forgiveness and salvation. We celebrated your son's death and resurrection on the cross last week. I pray that we should would celebrate it every week and every day of the year, not just on Easter. Our nation is in a real mess. We pray that you would bless our local, state, and national leaders and give them strength, integrity, and purpose to seek your, your truth in the decisions that they make. We pray also for our missionaries and our military service and men and women, and especially those serving in harm's way all over the world. Give them your strength and comfort. We ask forgiveness for when we fail to be what you have called us to be. Teach us how to love and serve people every day, not just on Sunday. We pray that the Holy Spirit will give us the strength to be good examples for you. On a local level, we have many people in our community and in our church with health concerns. We pray that you would give them strength and heal them if it be your will. We pray for wisdom for our elders and for other church leaders in our, in our church. And finally, we pray for Pastor Jeff and his family, and today we pray that you would give him the understanding of the, the Bible, that he might present a lesson that would help us to come out and to go out and be better examples for you in the everyday world. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. All right. Um, how many of you have been to Bible Memory Camp? Okay. Uh, Bible Memory Camp is over in Shoto, for those of you that don't know, and it is a long standing tradition here for um, children grades two through high school to go in the summer. And uh, I know that. Uh, Parents and grandparents in the local church are the ones that are primarily the ones who teach our children about a relationship with God. But there's something about going to camp that um, gives children that experience of learning from other believers and seeing, oh, there's more adults than just my parents and grandparents who love God and I can learn from. And uh, I had already had those thoughts and then I asked what... Lakin and Axel's uh, reasons would be for why you should go to camp. And I thought it fit very well with that. Lakin says that because you get, you get uh, the point of God better, there's opportunity to talk with kids around you about the Bible. And Axel says it's a good place to learn how to work and cooperate with other kids. And you're around them all the time. And you get to memorize verses. So that sounds like a good time. And I know they do a lot of other things there, too. Um, Pleasant View provides, um, uh, pays for the costs for children who attend our Wednesday evening services and learn the verses and attend class. Um, now, some of our people also go to Colorado to Rocky Mountain Mennonite Camp, and so we work with that also. So um, I need to have children registered by April 21st. And if you have children between uh, grades two through high school, you will probably, you should find papers in your mailboxes with the information on how to go to, on the website and register. And there's a checklist on the back of the different things you need to do. So if you would um, let me know that your child is going and hand in the paperwork to me by April 21st, that would be great. So uh, let me see, the websites are on there. 
uh, for Bible Memory Camp this year, high school camp is May 28th through June 1st, and then elementary and junior high is June 3rd through 6th. And Rocky Mountain Camp has some different dates. So um, we are going to watch a video. Uh, the camp director, Chris Howell, is going to tell us about uh, camp and some of the ways that it has impacted people's lives. Hi, my name is Christopher Howell. I'm the executive director of Bible Memory Ministries in Goshen, Indiana. I have the privilege of helping with this ministry with a wonderful board and a ton of great volunteers and staff to help us do what we do. It's just not a summer camp thing. It's a Bible memorization that helps kids become leaders by learning how to apply those scriptures in life. And we get various testimonies all the time of how God's done that. What I want to do is I want to read to you the testimony of a gentleman named Dennis Har that God brought into uh, contact with us recently. Listen to this testimony. The year was 1965 when a little Mennonite boy at the age of 12 years old really wanted to go to church camp for the first time in his life. I was attending Marion Mennonite Church in Howell, Indiana, where I was challenged to go to church camp in Sturgis, Michigan. Our family really didn't have the money to send me, but someone in the church told me if I would learn 300 Bible verses, I could go to church camp for free. Little did I know at the time that opportunity would change the trajectory of my life. I learned those 300 Bible verses and I headed off to church camp. I assumed it was just a Marian Mennonite thing. I did not realize there was such a thing as Bible memory program or Bible memory ministries on a national level. At the age of 12, 58 years ago on a Thursday night around campfire, I answered the call of ministry on my life. I could still take you to the very spot around the campfire where my life totally changed. I knew my life would never be the same. I thank the church, the people that listened to me quote those 300 verses, and the challenge from the church to go to camp. In 1976, I graduated from Bible college and entered full-time ministry as a lead pastor for 45 years. By the grace of God, I have continued preaching at various churches most Sundays since retiring. The Lord has been so very good to me. My experience at Bible Memory Camp has afforded me the opportunity to impact the lives of hundreds of individuals. I have often think about what my life might be today if I hadn't experienced those incredible, unforgettable nights around the campfire. Over the past five decades, I frequently have used many of those very verses I've memorized. After retiring and through a series of God-ordained events, I went to work for Chuck Insurance in Sturgis, Michigan. Bible Memory Ministries is one of the clients I serve now. My director and friend, Rod Chupp, filled me in about the ministry one day, and after I inquired about them, what a revelation that day was. It was May 5th, my 70th birthday, when I learned there was a ministry organization behind the Bible verses I learned as a little 12-year-old boy. All those years, I never knew Bible Memory Ministries was the driving force behind it all. A week later, I walked into Bible Memory Ministries headquarters in Goshen, Indiana for the first time and got to personally thank Chris Howell, the executive director, for the impact this ministry has had on my life. It was a very impactful and fulfilling day. See, we're just not a summer camp. We're getting the Word of God into the lives of kids that it can change and alter their trajectory. Will you partner with us? Will you pray for us? Will you support us in ways that we can get this across? This great nation that needs God's hand to move upon us. We ask that you look into your heart and pray over that. And tell us more about the testimonies that you have that maybe God has done through Bible Memory Ministries. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you, Margaret. I know a lot of people in this room have been involved with Bible Memory at some point in some fashion or another, so thank you for that update. Um, at this time, I invite the children to come forward to put money in the offering bank. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
God's song, Sanctuary Father. Let us sing this in a uh, in a prayerful spirit, Lord, as we truly are in the word you say, preparing us to be a sanctuary, uh, building the call of you. We'll be reading from Acts, the first chapter. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, he was eating with them. He gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Lord, I just thank you for our servant Jeff, your servant Jeff, Lord, who is uh, willing to uh, bring us a message this morning. I would just pray, God, that you would give him the words to speak. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds, to put away the distractions that might uh, be influencing us so that we could receive what you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you've been reading about the children of Israel entering the promised land and we're hoping for some sort of a sermon based on that, I'm going to disappoint you today. Uh, we'll get back to kind of our reading plan in May, uh, but in April we're going to go kind of a different direction and we want to focus on 
the church, right? Kind of what we've gathered under the umbrella of, right, today. Um, And again, I'm picking up this theme that the elders have set for this year, this idea of rediscovering the church. Now, I'm going to be in more teacher mode than normal this month, all right? So by, by nature, I'm a teacher, not a preacher, and so I will really be expressing that. My task this month, then, is to kind of challenge our current understanding of the church, right? The way you use the word, what you mean by that. When you say church, who you're referring to, okay? That's what I'm interested in. And then second, I want to provide, if you don't have a good understanding of the church, an alternative vision of the church. Hopefully something closer to what God intended than what we have settled for in our culture today. So when I talk about our misunderstanding, I'm talking about Pleasant View, I'm talking about the churches in our community, I'm talking about the churches in the U.S. Well, this idea of rediscovering the church begins with a primary question, right? What is the church? Um, If you were to ask my son Ben, he would say it means going to church. Um, He would equate church with taking candy out of my office, as would many of the other kids in our church today, right? Um, Church means different things to different people. And no doubt, if I polled all of you, you would have a little different understanding of what church is based on your experience with it. Answering the question, what is church, though, is fairly crucial in rediscovering it. Some of the ancillary questions that we may have that are associated with this idea of what is church is, can I be a part? Can I belong? Will they accept me just as I am, just in my street clothes or something else, right? Am I experiencing church? This is something for us to grapple with if you've always kind of attended services somewhere all your life. Am I experiencing it? Great, if you said yes. And if you didn't, What are you going to do in response to it? Other questions that we might ask related to the church. What should the church be? Right? What should the church be? And if it's not what it should be, then how do we get there? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the coming weeks. Well, this idea of what is church and rediscovering the church is extremely important to us today. Um, I believe that we have a wrong understanding of what church is and why it exists. I feel like our understanding of church needs to mature, okay? So I'm not saying it's it's an infantile understanding, and I'm not necessarily speaking to each of you, but in general, across the U.S., I think we have an understanding of the church that I would call a little bit adolescent. That is, it's a little bit like a child in a relationship with their parents. Bear with me here, right? Teenagers are at a stage where they are starting to express their individuality and exercise their independence. Parents then are seen as sometimes controlling, domineering, sometimes we're even out of touch, or so our kids think. Many people in our society today think the same way about the church, right? They're they're trying to exercise their, their spirituality, and they feel like that which is, that is the church, is too controlling, it's trying to put them in a certain box, it's trying to make them think a certain way. Western culture tends to devalue what is, right? We're always in favor of the new thing. That's why new gets our attention. A new car, a new politician, new policies. New captures us. But it's not always where we want to be. As believers, we tend to forget that we are joining something that was set in motion 2,000 years ago, all right? So it's far bigger than us. We are just joining something that is already moving. Some would argue that the church really started with Adam and Eve. I'm only going to go back as far as Jesus. And so as we explore this idea of rediscovering the church or what is church today, uh, I'm going to use the early church as a backdrop to answer some of these questions and maybe in the process answer some of the questions that you have related to church. Well, let's, let's jump right in. If you have um, your Bible or God's Word somewhere on a device, I invite you to open it up. Luke is the author here, and he begins, In my former book, Theophilus, maybe his benefactor, 
I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven and after giving, and after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. I'm going to kind of pause here for just a moment. I want to recognize that our conversation about the church really begins with Jesus, right? In these opening verses of Acts, Jesus is the central character to the story. The prequel to Acts is actually the Gospel of Luke. And it's in this Gospel that Luke, who's not a disciple, but someone writing about it later, is identifying who is a part of this Jesus movement and what Jesus means to everyone, right? Um, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is always seen as drawing people to himself. And as he's doing this drawing people to himself, he is simultaneously drawing them to each other. Um, Michael, I liked your object lesson this morning with the wheel, right? As we grow individually closer to Jesus, we are getting closer to each other. This is what Jesus was all about. Jesus will draw 12 in particular, and he will name them, and he will call them his apostles. Now, what's interesting is who these people were. The 12 that Jesus called are all Jews. Okay, so by ethnic standards, they're all from the same group of people. But they come from very different parts of Jewish life. Some are fishermen, which is not the primary trade of Israel. One is a tax collector, means, meaning that he works for the Romans, Another is a zealot, which means he is working against the Romans. And all of these guys come together under the umbrella of Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is really kind of the, the genesis point for the church, if you will. The term church itself is going to describe... Whoops, I've got something out of order here. The church starts with Jesus. The church also describes Jesus' followers. Now, Luke will use the term apostles, and then he adds the qualifier in this opening verses, the ones Jesus had chosen. From that point on, Luke refers to this group simply by the plural pronouns of them and they, which is handy, right? It's easier to say, but it leaves some ambiguity, leaves some questions about who is he really talking about? We want to know. As the book of Acts continues, this definition of them and they being just the apostles becomes too exclusive, right? It's too small. It's too particular. By Acts 1.14, the group now includes the women, and we don't know how many. These are the women that would have been following along with Jesus. It includes Jesus' mother, Mary, and Jesus' brothers, right? So the group is growing. And by the next verse, verse 15, they're growing exponentially, Luke will identify the number that gather in that upper room is 120. So what starts out as a group of 12 gets whittled down to 11, now is exploding to 120. Now, fortunately, Jesus has already given this growing group a name, right? They've moved beyond disciples, they've moved beyond the pronoun them and they, and now he's going to define it the church, right? And it's spoken in conjunction with Simon Peter in kind of the final year of Jesus' earthly ministry. This is where Jesus asked the question to his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And then he turns the question directly to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And it's at this point where Simon Peter will launch into his say, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah of God. And Jesus says, you're absolutely right. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And then he goes one step further and he tells them, I tell you that you are Peter. He's changing his name. And on this rock, which is another term for Peter, I will build my church. Not them, not they, not some nebulous group of people. But he's referring to something different, something beyond the language of the Old Testament when we hear about God's people. Now he's talking about the church. And this group of people, he says, the gates of hell, hell will not overcome. Now, when he uses the word church here in this particular case, 
He's talking about ecclesia, okay? Ecclesia. This would be the Greek term, and it's just an assembly of people. Now, uh, we know that it's more than just an assembly of people in this case, right? Jesus is talking about something in particular. And so it's an assembly of people being shaped by God. And I'm using kind of the definition from our book, Rediscover the Church, that Michael shared it in his opening comments. Now, as we think about church, I want you to think on two different levels. First, there is the church universal, and that's everybody, okay? And then there is the church local, something specific. So just as Jesus is talking about his disciples, he's meaning some very specific people, and then he gets wider with them. The church is much wider than Pleasant View, but Pleasant View is a part of the church universal. Okay? It's important as we think about this because I believe this is kind of the natural progression that will occur, not only for the gospel, but even in the book of Acts. You see, when the good news is shared, people are drawn to it. And where there was one believer, suddenly now there are two or three. And suddenly this group of people begins to grow and grow. So the, those who are sharing the gospel and those that are receiving the gospel now are practicing the gospel together. The result is an ever-growing group of people, somewhere around 2.2 billion today from a group of 11 Right? It's amazing, right? the multiplication that God does. These people, when they're pulled together then, have to live out their faith. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it look like? These people can be called believers. They can be called followers. And Jesus even includes the term a church. Well, let's move forward to Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to pick up then um, 4 through 8. And this is a little bit, well, I'll just read it and then I'll make comment. On one occasion, while he, and this is Jesus, was eating with them, and the them primarily refers to the disciples, 11 at this point, we think, but it could include more. He gave this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, this would be Jesus again, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Okay. Again, they have a mis misunderstanding of what is going to be restored. They're still thinking in very tangible national terms. It's the same thing we talked about on the triumphant entry, triumphant in, triumphant entry just a few weeks ago. Right? They were expecting a nation state. That's what Israel had always been. Jesus is offering something different. He's ushering in something new. Remember, it's a church. He answers them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's at this point where I think uh, it's helpful to unpack this last verse, verse 8. Um, uh, when I was in Sunday school today and we were talking about this, this is well-trod material, right? We're, we're familiar with this. But I want us to think a little bit about what the implications are of Jesus' words. Now, Luke does not use the word church in verse 8. In quoting Jesus in Acts 1, 8, Luke uses another word closely associated with the church, and you can pick it out here, witnesses. Jesus is telling them that they will testify by word and action that he is indeed the Messiah. Jesus is giving this group of people a purpose, okay? And for Luke's part, he's essentially repeating the words heard before Jesus' ascension, and this comes from kind of the, the last moments, uh, if you will, where Jesus is with his disciples. Um, it's here that he opens their minds so that they can understand scriptures. And then he tells them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. This term, all nations, moves this from being a Jewish movement to being a worldwide movement, a church-wide movement, a church-universal movement. Remember, 
Jews saw the world in two categories, either Jew or Gentile, those who were a part of God's people and those who weren't. Jesus is breaking down those barriers when he starts using church language and calling them to do something beyond just Israel. Now he's sending them out to everywhere. Now, the purpose that's being given then is to testify to Jesus' words and works through words and works something that we're the recipient of today, right? We're, this is still our purpose. I think it's helpful, like, when you go to an, a meeting, um, like the uh, one that was held here yesterday, the Mennonite Disaster Service, and as they're talking about the projects they do, they don't miss the opportunity to explain why, right? Why are we doing what we're doing? Because God has called us to serve. God is the one who's redeemed us. Our actions, our words flow out of who Jesus is. Remember, the church starts with Jesus. The church is just another name for Jesus' followers. And now we have developed this idea of what our purpose is. It's to be about Jesus' works and words. Now, you've probably heard this uh, quote before, but I will share it with you again. Because this is the, the result of our works in our words, right? You may be the only Bible that someone reads. Remember in the Gospel of John, John talks about the Word becoming flesh, and that's Jesus. Have you ever thought about yourself as being the Word of God made flesh for others to see? And for some people, that's the only Bible they're ever going to read. So we don't want to miss our chance. We don't want to miss our opportunity to fulfill this purpose. Now, the purpose given here is why our churches, and I say church now specifically, not globally, while our church, Pleasant View's church purpose statement starts with this sentence. PVMC is a community of disciples of Jesus. Okay, we're defining what church is. Notice the shift here from using the church to describe universal, all right, so I'm not talking about everywhere. I'm talking about a specific place. While Christians are a part of the church universal, if they accept Jesus Christ and profess him as their Lord and Savior, uh, we are not like God in that we can't be everywhere at once, right? You are somewhere in particular. We are bound by space and time. Today, you are a part of the worship service here at Pleasant View. For some of you, you have made the additional choice to be in covenant with others who are here. We call it membership, right? Um, because we are limited by kind of this witness of a local response, this becomes church for us, right? Today, our witness here is at Pleasant View. Now, notice I've kind of replaced some words. Um, I've also replaced uh, ecclesia or assembly with a more commonly used phrase, Community. Uh, assembly can refer to a single gathering or many gatherings. Community has a little different sense. It speaks of continuity and consistency. Uh, Jesus would talk about um, churches being a light on a hill, or that's what believers are called to be. When you get us all together, we create this outpost for the gospel, if you will. Now, community can be defined a number of different ways, and this is where it gets hard for us because we are a part of lots of different little communities. Let me explain. If we define community as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common or a feeling of fellowship with others because of a common attitudes, interests, and goals, we can be a part of a lot of different things. Visually, it looks something like this. Pleasant View is primarily graphically bound, right? We can only drive so far, although we've got a number of people that tune in via our live stream. We've got a number of people who drive an hour or more to be here every Sunday, and we've got people who drive just a few minutes to get here each day. So there is a kind of a geographic element because we don't have anyone coming from Texas. Well, I take that back. We've got some guests from Texas today. Most people don't come from Texas, Arkansas, Kansas, or New Mexico to join us in worship, right? So we're somewhat geographically bound. We're somewhat ethnically bound. As I look out, there's not a lot of diversity in the people that I see. In some parts of our country, the diversity is far greater. Now, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying what's here. Sometimes people will define themselves exclusively by their ethnicity. 
And if it's not by geographical means or ethnicity, then we do it by interest. Um, there was a couple years ago where it seemed like owning a Harley was kind of the thing to have, right? And to be a part of this group, you had to have a motorcycle. I never was a part of the group because I never had a, a motorcycle, right? Um, some of our interest groups require us to have certain things or have a, a certain buy-in or certain gifts and certain skills. These are all the different communities we organize under. But remember, Christ is offering us a different way to organize. These are all fine and good, but where should our primary community lie? It lies in one that is extremely inclusive, right? It's not bound by geographical boundaries. It's not one that is closed by ethnicity. It's not even one that is limited by interests and maybe the, the wealth or the gifts that you need to have to be able to connect with those certain interests. We're bound by purpose, okay? And everybody can be a part of purpose. And this is really the good news, right? If you want to follow Jesus, you can. There is nothing that can keep you out except yourself. So if you've come here today and you're like, you know, I am beyond forgiveness. God can't have any kind of a plan for me. He can't have a purpose for me because I, I just don't belong here. I'm telling you today, you do. The only person getting in the way of that is you. Because this purpose is something that everyone can have. That's why Pleasant View is a community of disciples of Jesus Christ. We are purpose-driven, if you will. Or that's what I hope we're getting to. Well, in response to Acts 1, let me ask the question here. Uh, so what is church to you? What is your definition of church? How would you answer the question if you're out today and you happen to come across someone talking about church and you say, well, this is how I see it. What are the words that you're going to use? And I wonder, has it changed? Do you still see church as somewhere that you go? Is church still about something that others are a part of? Is church limited to the structure that we're gathered in today? Well, I hope that as we've explored Acts just a little bit, that perhaps your definition has changed. And if it's changed, then I ask you, how will you live it out, right? Let your words and your works demonstrate an understanding of church that's bigger than the one that is present in our society today. Now, if you're wondering what in the world are you talking about, Jeff, or I need somewhere to kind of latch on to, let me give you kind of a, a comparison litany that we're going to kind of close with today. This is talking about things that I think people see the church as and things that I think the, true, that the church truly is. Now, we're going to repeat this for the next four Sundays. And so my hope is that you will start to adopt some of these words as your own. So even if you don't have a real good definition of church today or one that you feel comfortable with, I hope by the end of this month and maybe using some of these words, you will have something. All right? So let me read it, and then we're going to read it together. Church isn't a place. It's a people. It's not an organization. It's an organism. It's not an establishment. It's a movement. Church isn't an institution. It's a Jesus revolution. And I would add, and he's calling everyone to join, right? He's calling everyone to join. All right, congregation, do you think we can say this together? I just heard us sing together, so I know that we can kind of sing together, but speaking is different, all right? So take it as it's phrased. Church isn't a place, it's a people. It's not an organization, it's an organism. It's not an establishment, it's a movement. Church isn't an institution, it's a Jesus revolution, and he's calling everyone to join. May we live out our better understanding of church as Jesus came to give it to us. Now, before we close our service today, I'm going to walk to the back and find Dakota Miller. Uh, later today, right, Dakota, you're, having, you're leaving, right? All right, well, I'm going to join you back here. 
Go ahead, stand up. You can just kind of slip out. Or Now, as Dakota is practicing church, he's going a little bit wider. Tell us about what you anticipate doing over the next, was it 10 days? Yes. 10 days. All right, so what are you going to do? Uh, we are going to Hawke, Panama, which is in the southwestern part of Panama. Uh, we'll be right along the ocean, and we're going to a village down there to work with the uh, uh missionaries that live down there and we're going to be working with the kids in the school which is a big deal because they don't allow anybody in the school so it's going to be uh, quite interesting I think so okay so if you didn't catch that he's headed to Panama he's going to be working near the ocean and primarily in a school Mm -hmm. now you use the word we who are you talking about right Uh, we're going with the uh, first baptist church and thomas okay a few other churches so Okay, so we have a bit of an ecumenical mission trip, if you will, that uh, Dakota gets to go and be a part of. Well, Dakota, as uh, being a part of that trip, uh, we recognize that this is, is this, this is your first time to Panama, mm-hmm. first time out of the country? Yep. Okay, so there's going to be some new things, right? Yeah. Um, the good news is God's gone before you, mm-hmm. right? For you, the news is it's going to be different, <laughs> all right? And so we want to pray over Dakota as he's getting ready to go. So congregation, I invite you to stand kind of extend arms towards Dakota, and then Kyle will get up and lead us in our closing song as soon as we're done praying. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks. We give thanks that the church includes a local people, and it includes more than just us. Lord, we lift Dakota to you. Uh, we pray that you will keep him well. Uh, while he's in Panama, we pray that you will open his eyes, that he will see you moving already there in their midst. Lord, I pray that uh, you would use him and his gifts in ways that would be pleasing to you, and that the purpose of the kingdom to testify to your works and words would be evident both in Dakota's life and his words. Uh, Lord, watch over him and those who are traveling alongside Uh, grant them safety in their travels um, and a life-changing kind of experience. Lord, we'll give you the glory for it as he returns and tells us all about it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Kyle, if you'd lead us in our closing song.